Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. After more than a month, the strike between GM and the UAW union is over. Ahead, we'll look at their agreement and what it means for Hoosier workers. Farmers struggling with low prices and bad weather are giving up some of the land they usually use to plant corn and soybeans for solar panels. There's more money in producing electrons than in producing corn and soybeans at this time, particularly at this time. Ahead is solar power the way to help farmers make ends meet. And for some students, it's impossible to thrive in a normal school setting. I didn't have anybody there to tell me to keep going, you know. Do your work. I was skipping class. Coming up, a look at a new program that works to help kids who would likely otherwise slip through the cracks. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines from across the state, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Well, the proposed deal between the United Automobile Workers and General Motors is in the hands of local union members. As Samantha Horton reports, exactly one month after workers went on strike against GM, union leadership announced Wednesday it had reached a tentative agreement with the automotive company. Small fires burn along the picket line outside the GM facility in Bedford, keeping UAW members warm. Indiana is home to four GM facilities, this one in Bedford, as well as Kokomo, Marion, and the Fort Wayne area. And together they employ about 7,000 workers. Workers have been out picketing for a month, fighting for better health care, higher wages, and more paths for temporary workers to permanent employment. The mood shifted to cautious optimism Wednesday afternoon, as protesters got word that a potential deal was in the works. There's a lot of moving parts to these things, so um, we want to hear the details. We want to hear exactly what um, what's in the tentative agreement. Now that UAW leadership approved the deal, local union members will vote on the proposed contract before it can be approved and finalized. We have a great deal of faith in our international leadership. They've done an incredible job. So if they have signed off on it, then I think that our membership um, will come to it with open ears and be ready to listen to whatever that they bring us. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Samantha Horton. Now, the tentative four-year contract includes pay raises, lump sum payments to workers, and a path to permanent employment for temporary workers. A spokesperson for the UAW says voting will start this weekend, and members will have eight days to ratify the agreement. The nationwide strike will continue until a new contract is finalized. For the past few months, Indiana University students have been helping 14 cities in the state to do greenhouse gas inventories. The idea is for cities to look at which sectors emit the most gases that contribute to climate change and try to make them greener. As Rebecca Thiel reports, the city of Bloomington recently finished, finished its inventory. Vic Kelson is the director of City of Bloomington Utilities. He's showing Savannah Rodrigue, the IU student doing Bloomington's greenhouse gas inventory, around a booster station. It helps the city pump water out to where it's needed. This booster station uses about $20,000 a month of electricity. Uh, we were able to offset about 5% of that with the solar panel array that we'll see outside. Bloomington's local government operations make up less than 10% of the city's overall greenhouse gas emissions. But of that 10%, Rodrigue found that most of the emissions come from moving and treating water and wastewater. Rodrigue says most of the time, working on the inventory isn't this hands-on. She makes a lot of phone calls to utilities and city departments, asking for data, and then inputs that data into a computer program called ClearPath, which calculates the emissions. 
even though Rodrigue doesn't have to do the math herself, that doesn't mean the process is easy. Every little detail counts. Take air travel, for example. We've got um, a very large student population that probably travels home and we travel to Indianapolis airport, you know, to, to fly home or some other mechanism for getting home. And that those emissions need to be counted, even though they're not directly within the city limits. This week, the city of Bloomington released the finished inventory. It found that transportation and residential energy use made up about half of the city's emissions. Alex Crowley is the city's director of economic and sustainable development. He says now that the city knows transportation in Bloomington is a big contributor to climate change, the city can take steps to make walking, biking, and public transit more accessible for residents. Make it easier for people not to get in their car alone and drive to work alone, uh, as, as so many people do in Bloomington. Lowering residents' energy use may be more challenging. Lauren Travis is the city's assistant director of sustainability. She says most of the city's power comes from Duke Energy's coal plants. So, I mean, it's difficult because we have only one place that we source our energy from, and a lot of people don't right now have the option otherwise. Bloomington's goal is to reduce its emissions by 26 percent by 2025. The city plans to use the greenhouse gas inventory to set a new and likely more ambitious climate goal. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Rebecca Thiel. Now, the latest on this week's top stories. A disciplinary case against Attorney General Curtis Hill is scheduled to, is scheduled to begin next week. The complaint against Hill comes out of accusations last year that he inappropriately touched four women, including a state lawmaker, at a post-legislative session party. Hill is trying to block two women from testifying about allegations of sexual misconduct stemming from his time as the Elkhart County prosecutor before he became attorney general in 2017. Hill's lawyers argue such testimony is unrelated to the misconduct ch uh, charges. The disciplinary case could lead to actions by the state Supreme Court, including dismissal of the complaint, reprimands, and being stripped of his license to practice law. Well, public meetings to discuss Bloomington's proposed unified development ordinance have started. The UDO lays out the rules for land use and development in Bloomington. And during public comment, many residents voiced concerns about how pushing multifamily housing in core neighborhoods could affect properties. And investors going to invest in it. They're not going to put affordability on it. They will uh, rent it at, at market rate. So you've lost that. The council will meet again Tuesday to continue the UDO hearings. The state plans to appeal a judge's recent ruling ordering the release of the man who was convicted of killing Indiana University student Jill Bierman. A grand jury found John Myers guilty in 2006 of the disappearance and murder of Bierman. Earlier this month, a federal court ruled that Myers had received ineffective counsel during his trial. Myers is being held in Michigan City at the Indiana State Prison. Well, soon all that will be left of Bloomington's 4th Street parking garage is the walkway bridge. Workers started the demolition process after Labor Day and should be finished by the end of the month. But the design plans for a new garage remain up in the air. The city is trying to acquire the property south of the garage through eminent, dom through eminent domain. Bloomington Mayor John Hamilton says the judge should issue a decision by the end of the month. Juan Carlos Carasquel owns the property the city wants. The city is offering to pay Carasquel $587,500. That's almost $88,000 more than Carasquel paid for it in March of 2018. And the city would offer him office space on the ground floor of the new garage. Look at my building, it's just a perfect location for me. And for a government to use the, the force that they are allowed to use for exclusive purposes and, 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 and then offer me back the space is almost insulting. Hamilton says if the judge rules in favor of Carasquel, the city would most likely appeal and or redesign the garage. Either go taller uh, or shrink fewer spaces for the public use. Um, both of which would make a more expensive uh, per, per car, per space garage, and we're trying to be efficient with the public's money, too. The design is a six-story garage with 510 parking spaces and just more than 11,000 square feet of retail space on the ground floor facing Walnut Street. 
City officials hope to complete construction of the new garage in 2020. Indiana lawmakers are considering taxes on vaping products. The debate includes whether the levy should be at the wholesale level or at retail locations, what the rate should be, and if it should be based on liquid amount or nicotine levels. Any recommendations the committee makes will have to win approval from the legislature during the 2020 session. More than a dozen states are already taxing vaping liquids. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. We visit a new school designed to give kids who are struggling in the classroom the extra support they need to finish high school. And we respond to a viewer who asked what Bloomington leaders are doing to make sure people who have disabilities are not left behind as the city grows and changes. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You won't find anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Hoosier farmers are making less money per acre than they have in years, but some are trading corn and soybeans for solar panels. Brock Turner talked with one farmer who has crops in both Indiana and Illinois, and he says the incentives vary greatly from state to state. Mark Simons has been farming for 44 years. The majority of his nearly 1,000 acres are corn and soybeans but he's in the process of adding another crop into his operation, one that also relies on the weather. The word solar farm kind of capsulizes it because the electrons produced out there are just another crop. Instead of producing uh, carbohydrates, we're producing uh, clean, renewable energy that uh, goes on for a long time. The uh, solar project out there, it can be producing power 40 years from now. Simons says he'll have things up and running and delivering electricity to the grid before the end of the year. It's a sizable investment, but he believes the payout in the long run will be more than worth it. It's a multiple million dollar investment in uh, roughly eight acres. Simons plans to install 4,500 modules, and he's joining a growing number of farmers across the country who are hoping to diversify their revenue streams. While there isn't a single agency that keeps an exact count on the number of panels or farmers, experts say the number has increased significantly since the cost of solar panels decreased about 10 years ago. And that decrease has made the math work for Simons. To me, it's another crop. That's how I look at it, and that's how any, any businessman would look at it, I think. I just got to compare the, uh, the costs and the, the revenue. But as with most crops, producers are reliant upon a number of factors that determine the price they get. Simon says selling electricity back to the grid is filled with regulation that often changes. While his local electric providers are encouraging, he says it's not that way in other parts of the state. Utilities have a lot of political power, a lot of money behind them. They would like to see uh, power production stay in their hands rather than uh, uh, making it more egalitarian through more distributed energy. I think the big money wants to you know, maintain their uh, uh, control of the power system. But the end goal of utilities and electric providers is important to remember. Rural electric cooperatives, which serve a large portion of Hoosiers living in rural areas, are nonprofits. Their primary goal is to provide cheap power to less dense areas where the economics don't make sense for private providers to operate. When we do a deal, we're always looking to see how does this stand up on its own. So uh, we don't want to overpay for power. Brian Anderson is the Director of Economic Development and Public Relations at the Wabash Valley Power Alliance a nonprofit that provides electricity to individual member co-ops. They're the ones that are transmitting and generating the electricity that could be powering your home. We want to protect our members from 
you know, long-term price spikes or things like that. We want stability. So when we negotiate or we talk with a, a private landowner that maybe is producing more than they need, we're always thinking about that long-term price stability. What's in the best interest of maybe not one particular member, but the 330,000 members that are under our service. Up the MDP, out here, up our pole, to their pole, and across the street. So that is their pole right there? Yep. Two years ago, Indiana ended its net metering policy, which incentivized solar by providing customers the higher retail rate instead of a lower wholesale rate for excess energy they delivered back to the grid. Despite that policy shift, Anderson says he's seen more people interested in solar. We've seen an uptick in, in interest from just landowners in general looking for sustainable solutions then making some of those economics work by selling some of that energy back to the local utility or to a utility at a larger scale like us. But energy experts say it's unlikely Indiana will return to net metering. Instead, they say it's important to craft durable policies that won't change over time and will span across elections. We don't have evidence as of yet as to which model is the best, but I do think it's really important for states to think through their individual kinds of um, charges and, and what's necessary and, and of value. So we do see in absence of um, strong policy leadership, we see companies actually stepping up as well. Um, I'll also note that there's, there's le leaders and laggards and there will of course be some companies and some states that lag behind the others and in those cases yes it probably will happen it'll just happen much later than than those that are taking the leadership role carly says the cost of solar has decreased significantly in recent years and the technology has improved too it's projected that uh, we'll get uh, 1.85 uh, million kilowatts out of here that's enough power in a year to power approximately 180 homes. While Simons admits the policies in Illinois make it more economical, he's excited to get these eight acres in Indiana operational. If you're producing electricity at uh, a high enough rate, if you're, your payback is pretty darn good on solar. And it's much better in Indiana, or much better in Illinois because they have renewable energy credits that uh, help defray the cost, the initial startup cost of a solar system. And uh, it'd be nice if Indiana had some of those incentives. But Simons isn't complaining too much. There's more money in producing electrons than in producing corn and soybeans at this time, particularly at this time. <laughs> For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Well, a viewer contacted city limits recently with concerns that as Bloomington grows and changes, people with disabilities are being left behind or forgotten by their community. In light of this concern, Benta Boutier looked into what efforts the city makes and if people living with disabilities perceive these efforts as sufficient. In the downtown area, David Carter talks about the ways Bloomington has changed for people living with disabilities in the last 30 years. Carter is a longtime member of Bloomington's Council for Community Accessibility. Yeah, well, I joined after I was no longer standing. Um, I'm a sitting member in good standing. He's used a wheelchair for 44 years. Carter says that though there are always more improvements to be made, Bloomington was ahead of the curve in making the community more accessible for people living with disabilities since the ADA was passed in 1990. He says more ramps, curb cuts, and handicapped parking spots have been added in heavily trafficked areas like downtown. Making progress wasn't straightforward at first. To learn a new trade, which is to put curb ramps, which is the technical name for curb cuts, um, in sidewalks was a new thing for them, and they had to learn how to do that. And left to their own devices, they would just do it the old way, which did not include curb cuts. But he says as time's gone on, things have improved and the relationship between the city and Council for Community Accessibility became more collaborative. Michael Shermis is the Special Projects Coordinator for the city's Community and Family Resources Department and is the staff liaison for the Council for Community Accessibility. He agrees with Carter that the city has many things they need to improve for people living with disabilities. But he says that the city takes care to respond to people's requests for improvement quickly. Shermish shows us one of the areas the city repaired recently for better wheelchair access. 
uh, just a few days ago, uh, when you came down off of this grade onto this uh, alleyway here, it had been all bumpy and torn up and broken uh, pieces of uh, uh, asphalt. And uh, when a wheelchair were to go off onto that, uh, it would it would like be really difficult and hard to lift up and go over. Um, we put in a, a report about it, and they immediately came and put an asphalt hole on it, and the grade is now smooth. Maybe David would care to just drive down and show us. And there you go, nice and smooth. He says that the city makes efforts to make the town more accessible that don't always meet the needs of people living with disabilities. It has a meter that has an accessible symbol on it, but when you look to see the actual space itself, you realize that if somebody parks here, if they need to try to get out, they can't get out onto the curb. They have to get out into the street. They have to roll up into the street to the nearest place where there's a curb cut and come back down and all the way down to get to the meter. He and Carter then demonstrate what an ideal accessible spot looks like. As you're, when you park into it, you don't need a full-blown access aisle beyond it because it goes right onto the sidewalk and the sidewalk in his essence split up so that enables him to get out real easily and be able to turn and move right up onto the sidewalk with not that big of a grade. He can go either way. Carter says accessible transportation, ramps, and parking are just a few of the things that affect people living with disabilities. And to make sure no one is left out as the city progresses, people living with disabilities need to be at the forefront of change. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Taboutier. There is a lot of pressure on students these days between completing their education and fitting in socially can be a lot to handle. Adam Pinsker introduces us to a program in Marion County designed to prevent young people from slipping through the cracks. Allison Fiddler's road to the Compass Center started when she was only in seventh grade. I didn't have anybody there to tell me to keep going, you know, do your work. I was skipping class. I was... I just knew I couldn't do it by myself. It wasn't that Allison had disciplinary issues. She just felt like she couldn't make it work at Southport High School. She suffered from panic attacks and took medication for ADHD. I wasn't really a person good for a bigger crowd of people. Allison knew the principal of Compass Education Center from when she attended JWR, Perry Township's alternative learning program. Principal Tim Lovejoy says the goal of Compass Education Center is to ensure that each student graduates with a realistic plan for life after high school, whether it's college enrollment, military enlistment, or employment with a livable wage. The school has 77 students from the Perry Township District. All the students who want to attend Compass have to apply and be accepted. Lovejoy says the school is modeled after the Harris Academy in Brownsburg, which bills itself as a small learning community. The students at Compass aren't here for disciplinary issues. They're here because they either fell behind in credits or they simply learn better in smaller environments. This is a, a system set up for kids to be here that are socially not making it in the big high schools. Allison fell right into that category. She says the individual attention helped her get back on track. My teachers here would always make sure to help me and push me to do my work. If They would always check on me and make sure like I'm on my stuff. Like a lot of kids who struggle in the classroom, Allison was also facing problems at home. Her father nearly committed suicide. Life was difficult, but Lovejoy and his staff offered a helping hand. There was a time that if I wouldn't have been at school with Mr. Lovejoy, my dad would have passed. Students at Compass complete all the necessary requirements to complete high school and advance to college or a vocational or technical school. Uh, we had five uh, corporations come in, three colleges, Ivy Tech, IUPUI, and International Business came in and met with our kids. Allison decided she wanted to give back to the community. After graduating, she took a job at a local preschool. I love working with them and teaching them and being there for them. Lovejoy says he gets a lot of satisfaction from seeing students like Allison go from struggling to successful young adults. No one has a better job than me. No one in this township. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. A new film from Pegasus Pictures is debuting this weekend at the Buzzkirk Chumley Theater. The film Miss White Light is about a young woman who counsels terminally ill people who have a hard time letting go. There's, there's not a lot of, of full humanity when you see that in film a lot. And I wanted to 
show that side of it. The film is also being featured in the Heartland Inter International Film Festival. Pegasus Pictures began its business three years ago in Bloomington and has already produced three award-winning feature-length films. Indiana University professors are working to prevent the extinction of an indigenous tribe's native language. The American Indian Studies Research Institute houses thousands of archived audio recordings and books of various native languages, including Nakoda, an endangered language spoken by the Asini Bowen tribe in Montana. English is currently the tribe's dominant language, and the community hopes children learn Nakoda and pass it down. Archived Nakoda recordings are used as a base for building a K-12 curriculum that includes children's books, recorded stories, and grammar lessons. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online as we cover the news throughout the week at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.